Hello there. My name is Tyler Griffin, and this is Scripture Study Insights by Scripture Central. Today, 2 Nephi chapters 20 through 25. I'm very excited to jump into these particular chapters of our Scripture study because this is where we finish off that last big chunk of Isaiah chapters, and then Nephi begins to give us his commentary. An important thing to remember is that our current edition of the Book of Mormon, the way it has chapters and verses, that didn't exist until 1879 when Orson Pratt took the original versions, the 1830 edition, where there were no chapters, there were no verses the same way as they are here. They had much longer chapters, no footnotes and he then broke them up into smaller chapters. So, it's important to remember that chapters 25, 26, and 27 are one complete chapter in the original Book of Mormon. So, this seems to be Nephi's uh, follow-up commentary on what he just read to us, or recorded on the plates, rather, from 2 Nephi chapters 12 through 24 that big, huge uh, Isaiah chunk of, of chapters. So, if you get into chapter 20, 21, 22, 23, and you're confused or you're, you're not making sense of it, the recommendation is keep pointing back to chapter 25, 26, and 27 and see what Nephi says about it. In fact, in chapter 25, after he finishes uh, this, this long section of Isaiah, he says, Now I, Nephi, do speak somewhat concerning the words which I have written, which have been spoken by the mouth of Isaiah. So, he's, he's going to give us this, this tutorial, this mentoring um, guidance on what he hopes that we get. And in verse 4, you'll notice he, he acknowledges the fact that Isaiah is not your typical book of Scripture as far as ease of understanding. And so, he says, Wherefore, hearken, O my people, which are of the house of Israel, and give ear unto my words. For because the words of Isaiah are not plain unto you, nevertheless they are plain unto all those that are filled with the spirit of prophecy. So, Nephi, in, in this chapter, he's giving us all of these keys to unlocking understanding in Isaiah. Obviously, the, the first is to understand the Jewish manner of prophesying in verse 1, 2, and 3 recognizing that Isaiah doesn't speak in Greek literalism. He speaks more in Hebrew symbolism. So, he paints these pictures using symbols and then he often repeats them. And then the invitation to pray for the spirit of prophecy. And then at the very bottom of verse 4, he says, I shall prophesy according to the plainness which hath been with me from the time that I came out from Jerusalem with my father. For behold, my soul delighteth in plainness unto my people that they may learn. So, Nephi is saying, even though the words of Isaiah might not be completely plain to you because you don't understand his manner of prophesying or some of these other keys we're going to see later, he says, I'm going to speak unto you so plainly that you can't misunderstand. And then it's fascinating to note that in chapter 25, you get Christ mentioned 18, 19 times, depending on how you, how you number these, multiple times he's speaking very clearly, very distinctly of Jesus Christ. As if to say, you don't have to understand all of the history, all of the manner of prophesying among the Jews, or if we go down to verse 6, um, knowing concerning the regions round about, knowing all of the geography of the land from, from whence Nephi and Lehi came, those things help because that's the world, the history, the geography, the culture, the language, the people. That is the world out of which these writings of Isaiah were, were created. But even if you don't understand that world, you can still understand the world that resides on the page of the scripture and the world that these words create in our own life today with the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation. That's, that's a beautiful promise given to us. So, very quickly, as an overview, before we go back and jump into chapter 20, 
it's important to remember that if you look at the geographical area over in uh, the Holy Land, you get the Sea of Galilee here, Jordan River, there's the Dead Sea, here's Jerusalem. It's important to remember that what used to be united Israel got divided in the Old Testament, and now Isaiah is living in the southern kingdom of Judah, and above the kingdom of Judah is the kingdom of Israel, often referred to as Ephraim, and above the kingdom of Israel is the kingdom of Syria, and over here to the northeast is the kingdom of Assyria, and over here to the east, the kingdom of Babylon. This is what is called the Fertile Crescent. And so they wouldn't, Babylon, when they're going to conquer, they're not going to come probably directly west. They're probably going to come through the more fertile parts where you can support an army of, of men. And so here's the setup for everything that's happening in chapters 20 through 24. It's an example of these uh, children of Israel, the house of Israel, rejecting God, turning their back on the Savior, on their Redeemer, and so him allowing different nations to come in. So in chapters 19 and 20, you get the kingdom of Assyria who comes in. And remember that as Assyria is growing in their power and their dominion, Syria and Israel banded together and said, let's get Judah to join us, and Judah refused. And so Syria and Israel banded together and said, we're going to wipe out Judah and put a king of our choosing on the throne. So all of this is happening while Isaiah is the prophet in Jerusalem, in the kingdom of Judah, at this very time. It's leading into 721 BC. And the people are very nervous. What are we going to do? And I love what happens in chapter 20, uh, 19 and 20 actually, when Isaiah reassures them. He goes to the Lord, gets that reassurance, and he passes that on to the people that the Lord is going to help them if they'll just turn to him. Chapter 20 is all about King Sennacherib, who's the king of Assyria, who has brought his armies. He's destroyed every kingdom around him. He wiped out Syria. He, he overcame the kingdom of Israel and carried the ten tribes captive and scattered them after killing many and they're scattered among all the nations uh, to the north. And then he had come into the kingdom of Judah and he had wiped out most of the cities, except for Jerusalem, where Isaiah lives with King Hezekiah. And it's here in chapter 20 where the Lord, through the prophet Isaiah, makes it very clear what happens when we get so puffed up and think that we're the ones doing whatever it is that's, that's being accomplished. In this case, King Sennacherib is congratulating himself. Notice in chapter 20, verse 13, it says, For he, meaning Sennacherib, saith, By the strength of my hand and by my wisdom I have done these things, for I am prudent, and I have moved the borders of the people and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And he's boasting in his accomplishments, feeling like, look, look how amazing I am. I love this next part because Isaiah flips now into this beautiful Hebrew poetic symbolism mode where he says, verse 15, Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? 
as if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood. He's basically reminding us, if the Lord uses you as an instrument in his hands to accomplish his works, don't look at what is done and pat yourself on the back too long and feel too proud about what was accomplished because there's a difference between being the artist and being an instrument in the hands of the artist. And so he makes that beautifully clear here in this chapter. And then if you turn over into chapter 21, he describes how this house of Israel seems to have been cut down, wiped out, destroyed largely, other than in the, the city of Jerusalem that now they can start rebuilding. And there's this feeling that all is lost. Well, chapter 21 talks about a rod coming forth out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. A must-have cross-reference for your scriptures here is Doctrine and Covenants section 113, where Joseph is in a Q&A session with the Lord regarding many things here in chapter 21 or the equivalent Isaiah chapter 11. So if you want to understand chapter 21 symbolism better, then you use the resources given to us in Restoration Scripture, specifically in this case, section 113. Now, before we jump into chapter 22, it's important to note here how easy it is to get caught up in history, in geography, in culture, in that world that is living underneath the scriptures, that is the foundation um, of these scriptures that created these words that we now have. And if we're not careful, we'll get so caught up in the history that we'll miss the fact that it's all about the Savior Jesus Christ doing his work. It's really his story. So instead of just seeing people and wars and conquests, it's much more easy, easy to liken the scriptures to us if we can find him in these, these pages, that it's really his story, and then it's easier to translate it into the world that we live and see our story where we can see Jesus Christ, what he's doing for us. As he delivered those who turned to him in Jerusalem in 721 BC, who felt like the whole world was crushing in on them and there was no hope for deliverance as they turned heavenward, all of a sudden they discovered there was deliverance. And as we read these stories today, the power of Isaiah is that it can be repeated over time. These, these prophecies, they can, they're dualistic in that they can be fulfilled in his day. They can be fulfilled in Jesus' day. They can be fulfilled in our day and in the future as well, repeatedly. And the, the secret to unlocking that, according to Nephi's interpretation, is Jesus Christ who is mentioned more than any, any other chapter when you get to chapter 25. He's, he's showing us. What I just read to you, you should be seeing the fingerprints of the Lord throughout this entire story that was just told. Which now brings us to chapter 22. After the children of Israel are carried captive, the ten tribes, and the kingdom of Judah, um, is, was besieged, but finally delivered. Look at the last verse of chapter 21. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. So he's making this promise that as we brought the children of Israel into the promised land from Egypt, we're going to have a highway out of Assyria. That they're going to be brought back again. And verse 1 of chapter 22, In that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Thou wast angry with me, 
thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Now here is this beautiful um, layered perspective in Isaiah's writings. He is an amazing historian, but he's even a better seer. So he's able to tell the story from his day and from his time period that the Lord is going to do all of these incredible things and there's going to be this peace that is going to be brought among the people back in his day. But the, the events of his day are now lenses through which we can look into the future of the millennium. So you'll notice in our chapter heading of chapter 22, it says, in the millennial day, all men shall praise the Lord. He shall dwell among them. So it's this beautiful chapter of hope. If you struggle to understand Isaiah, read chapter 22 because it's one of the simple, it's, it's the shortest, it's one of the simplest to understand and it is filled with peace and mercy and compassion from Christ as he's delivering and gathering his people back into their lands of promise for them. So as you read the six verses of chapter 22, it's, it's this hope-filled uh, promise for a millennial day that has been fulfilled at other times in history but will ultimately find its fulfillment when Christ comes to reign personally upon the earth and when people will say, verse 2, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. I love that. People are now looking to God, to the, the Lord God of heaven, the Redeemer, to save them rather than looking to the might of men and armies and nations of the earth through the history of time, how people have looked to those things. And we've seen how that history played out. And so, as you read the rest of those verses in chapter 22, it's a beautiful foreshadowing of not just what the people in the millennium are going to experience, but what we today can experience more fully as we trust more and more and more in the Lord God to be our deliverer from these conquering Assyrian armies in whatever form they may take in our world and in our day, which now shifts us forward into chapter 23 and 24, which is all about Babylon. So Isaiah is writing from about 740 to, to 701 BC with this King Sennacherib and Assyrian conquest right there in the middle at 721. And now we shift to the time period of Babylon, which is 600 BC, the time of Lehi, about a hundred years after Isaiah. This is beautiful because now what you have is instead of Isaiah being just a historian telling you about what's going on in his day, he's now being a seer looking forward into the future a hundred plus years. Babylon takes over the region, this, this fertile crescent area, they become the world's dominating power and they are fighting against the, the kingdom of Judah who has banded with Egypt to try to deliver them. They've, they've looked to the Egyptians rather than looking to God. And this is at the time of Lehi when he's doing his preaching, time of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. This is all their, their day and age. So when you read chapter 23 and 24, put on your historical lenses of this time period of Babylon coming to destroy them. And it's amazing to watch this story play out. These people who have said, we don't want you to be our God. We want to rely on the Egyptians and these other things are going to get our devotion, not God. And so he allows Babylon to come and take them over. But then in chapter 23, you get the fall of Babylon. And then in 24, you get Isaiah's taunt song. 
he's saying things like verse 10, all they shall speak and say unto thee, art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? The world power, the, the nation that conquered all of the other nations in that time period, that was flexing its might and its muscle saying, we are the best. And he's saying, you've, you've fallen down, you've become like unto us. Keep in mind, Babylon is, is one of the wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It is glorious, this kingdom that was set up, but it becomes so proud and haughty that it falls. So, notice the comparison that Isaiah makes with Babylon, the king of Babylon. He says, verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? So he's comparing the fall of the king of Babylon to the fall of Lucifer, cut down from the heavens. Why was he cut down? It's because he said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit down upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So it's this self, self-aggrandizement. And then the, the promised outcome is verse 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and shall consider thee and shall say, is, is this the man? Narrowly look upon thee invokes this idea of, of a furrowed brow of slits, looking at somebody narrowly, saying, kind of in shock, is this the man that made the earth to tremble and that did shake kingdoms? Really? This is him? That's all there is to him? And it's this taunting song to show the reality of the majesty of God and the nothingness of the kingdoms of the world and the devil, um, ultimately in comparison to what God can do. Verse 27, for the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul, and his hand is stretched out, who shall turn it back? When God's hand is mentioned in the scriptures, his hand is stretched out still. It's usually in the context of delivering either reward or punishment for having kept or broken his covenant. So, if his hand is stretched out, nobody is going to turn back what is about to come. It's a natural spiritual consequence, either good or bad, depending on how we have responded to those covenant connections that he's offered us. Now, that brings us back to chapter 25, where we begin. Again, the keys to unlocking Isaiah are on this, the, these first eight or nine ten pages, or ten verses, rather. Look at verse 8. Wherefore, they, the words of Isaiah, are of worth unto the children of men, and he that supposeth that they are not, unto them I will speak particularly, and confine the words unto mine own people, for I know that they shall be of great worth unto them in the last days. For in that day shall they understand them, wherefore, for their good have I written them. I love that. Here's Nephi doing what Isaiah did, speaking prophetically as a seer looking forward to the last days, saying, ah, in the last days, those people will love the words of Isaiah because they'll be more plain to understand. They'll get them. Why? Because many of the prophecies that he talked about will find ultimate fulfillment, not just in Isaiah's history, but especially in the time of Christ and in the last days. You're going to more easily see the hand of God, which now brings us to the overview of these, these concluding chapters that Nephi gives us, chapter 25, 26, and 27, telling us, here's what I wanted you to get out of Isaiah. And if we look carefully, it can be divided this way. Chapter 25, verse 12 through 20 is a retelling of Nephi showing us how Christ is rejected by his own, his own people 
in his own time over in Jerusalem, how they turned their back on him. We've seen it in the writings of Isaiah, how the, the people in the kingdom of Israel and many in the kingdom of Judah rejected him and turned their back on him, and what happened, and how he was merciful and restored them and brought them back through Cyrus, the king of Persia. Um, but that cycle keeps repeating. Then they reject him again, and then he himself comes, and so when you're studying chapter 25, verse 12 through 20, notice all of these incredible uh, statements that Nephi is going to make regarding how Christ is rejected by his own. Then, in chapter 25, verse 21, all the way down through 26, verse 11. And remember, these chapter breaks that we have, added by Orson Pratt, 1879 edition, they're, they're different than the chapter breaks Nephi made. So, there would have been no, no separation between chapter 25 and 26 as far as Nephi is concerned. It's one continuous thought. So, in 26, uh, up through 26, verse 11, you get the rejection of Christ by the Nephites. So, here's Nephi writing this book, writing these words of Isaiah, glorying in the plainness of the prophecies of Jesus Christ, and then in vision, he's showing how his own people are going to turn their back on Christ and reject him. And then, in chapter 26, verse 12, through all the way down uh, through the end of chapter 27, and we're going to add 28 and 29 because it includes so much more. He, he extends it, this book written for our day. He shows how many people in the latter days are going to reject the Christ and turn to other, other sources for their inspiration and for their uh, hoped deliverance. So, come back now to chapter 25 and let's look at a couple of, of key verses to, to finish this off. Let's jump into verse 19. For according to the words of the prophets, the Messiah cometh in 600 years from the time that my father left Jerusalem. And according to the words of the prophets, and also the word of the angel of God, his name shall be Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This, this page has more reference to Jesus Christ by name, by title, than any other page of scripture. It is everywhere. Um, chapter 25 is saturated with the Lord Jesus Christ, which, isn't that interesting? Nephi just got finished reading these multiple chapters of Isaiah, and now he's mentioning Christ more than anywhere else in Scripture, in high, higher density than anywhere else in Scripture. I think that's the pattern we should look for when we're studying Isaiah, is to keep looking for our connections with Christ, to see his hand, his fingerprints on the stories that we're reading on the page. Then he goes on to say in verse 23, we labor diligently to write to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. So, if you take all those Isaiah chapters, all these stories of conquests and deliverance and scatterings and gatherings, to recognize it in that context, here's Nephi's statement, we know that it is by grace that we are saved, after all that we can do. You can assemble your armies, you can build your cities, you can build up kingdoms, but after all that you can do, everything that you can try to do, salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. Our hope and our deliverance is only found in him. And so, this most famous verse, 26, we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. Brothers and sisters, 
we may not have an Assyrian army led by King Sennacherib coming into our uh, neighborhood. We may not have the king of Babylon coming in and destroying our city and, and burning our temples, but we have a lot of opposition. There's a lot of sin. There's a lot of discouragement. There are a lot of problems. There are a lot of challenges that every one of us face. And I love this, this verse. I love this whole chapter. I love, I love what Nephi's done with Isaiah to point us to Christ so that our thoughts, our devotion, our trust, our faith is rooted in the only place where we have hope for deliverance and that is in Christ. I love him with all my heart and I'm grateful for his tender mercies in my life and in the life of my family to help us overcome these struggles and these conflicts, both internal and external uh, difficulties that we face. It's all through Christ that we have hope. I love him and I want to, to more than ever before, after a study of Isaiah, to be able to say with all my heart, I want thee to be my God, and I want to be thy son, a child of the covenant, a disciple of Christ. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved.